And welcome everybody. If you're just tuning in, uh, this is our second webinar of the virtual Earth Fest uh, hosted by Biosphere 2. And we're really honored to have uh, Jane Pointer and Tabor McCallum uh, join us today who have uh, maybe some of the most intimate history with this facility out of anybody. Um, and it's such a treat and I'm gonna introduce them in just a second once we uh, let the attendees come in, and once we hit that uh, 12 o'clock mark. Um, but as you get situated here on the Zoom webinar, uh, a couple of logistics, there's a Q&A chat in your Zoom panel. And if you open that up, you can type in questions for Jane and Tabor, uh, whom will be answering these questions on a rolling basis. Uh, so, uh, the other thing we like to hear from uh, people is where you're listening in from. Um, we've got people from around the world uh, joining us today. Uh, so it's a real treat, and we thank you for spending Earth Day with us, uh, at least part of it, and hope you guys can find a way to get outside, too. Um, so if you're just joining us, we've got Jane Pointer and Tabor McCallum on here, and uh, I'm, you know, really pleased that we all get the opportunity to ask these two questions and beyond their uh, role as crew members and designers of Biosphere 2, uh, they've led a, a very rich um, career in kind of uh, commercial space flight and space entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, Jane Pointer uh, is a space entrepreneur, Biosphere 2 crew member, author and speaker. Uh, she was a co-founder and founding CEO of Paragon Space Development. Uh, she was also a co-founder and founding CEO of Worldview um, and is currently a founder and co-CEO of Space Perspective. And uh, Tabor, also a founder and co-founding CEO of Paragon Space Development, uh, Worldview, and space perspective. So you guys have been uh, partners in crime for quite a while, uh, both as crew members at the Biosphere uh, and co-founders on a variety of, of business ventures, um, particularly revolving around space. Um, and just briefly, you know, uh, these businesses, Paragon and Worldview, uh, they're involved with uh, sending hardware to uh, places like the International Space Station, uh, deep dives uh, in our world's oceans, uh, as well as kind of some of the first uh, commercial attempts at colonizing the Earth's stratosphere. And hopefully we'll be able to get uh, some uh, more modern uh, context to some of their modern ventures. But I think there's a lot of interest today uh, with Jane and Tabor's early uh, origins at Biosphere 2. Uh, so we'll start with that. And uh, I, I guess my first question starting off in the honor of, birth, of, of Earth Day is, what is a biosphere? <laughs> uh, well, that, that's actually a, an interesting question because we had to wrestle with that at the Biosphere 2 project. Um, it's sort of hard to uh, re remember, uh, and some of you actually don't even remember, that Biosphere the word biosphere was not in the popular lexicon, right? That, that idea that the earth has a biosphere around it, that's sort of a semi-self-regulating uh, living system uh, was a pretty new idea that Biosphere 2 was actually a part of, of really introducing. So a, a biosphere as we defined it uh, is materially closed. So the earth's biosphere is materially closed by gravity Biosphere 2 is materially closed by glass and steel, energetically open, so radiant energy comes in to grow the plants and, and provide energy to the system, and informationally open, so we can send information in and out. Um, and so that's the, uh, the, the fundamental definition of a biosphere. So um, uh, what we thought we'd do, Aaron, is uh, go through a few slides, show some baby pictures of Biosphere 2, talk a few minutes about what it was like to be inside and isolation and a little bit about what we're doing and then open it up for, for questions. Um, if that works. That sounds great. Yeah. Good. Hey everyone. 
Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the image that you're looking at now is uh, one of the first concept drawings we did of Biosphere 2. Of course, this was before the days of, of computer-aided design. Uh, and so the idea was to test this hypothesis uh, that a, a, an artificial biosphere could be made from the ecosystems that comprise the Earth's biosphere. And that that resulting biosphere could be both a, a laboratory for uh, the study of ecosystems, uh, as well as a way to uh, colonize other planets, of, you know, take life to other places in the solar system. So uh, Biosphere 2 in that theme had natural ecosystems uh, from the tropics, uh, rainforest, ocean, savanna, thorn scrub, marsh, and desert. And of course, because it had people inside it, we needed an agriculture and a habitat. And it was designed to all be airtight, sealed, which we got to about 8% gas exchange per year, which is actually pretty extraordinarily tightly sealed. And these things called lungs allow the air to expand and contract with temperature inside. So it was a super exciting idea that we were uh, attempting to create humanity's first other biosphere. Of course, biosphere one is planet Earth, biosphere two, the structure that we all know and love. Uh, and so here is an early couple of baby pictures of biosphere two. Um, uh, as Aaron mentioned, Tabor and I were both on the design team. Tabor was involved and in charge of the, uh, the, the analytical systems, the analytical chemistry systems. I was in charge of initially of the insects and then took over the uh, agricultural system. Uh, and uh, so it was sealed on the bottom. I'm sure many of you have toured it. It was sealed on the bottom, still is today, uh, with steel all the way under. You don't see it all the way through because that's then covered in concrete. And then of course sealed above ground with the, the steel and glass. And one of the biggest questions is how are we going to get this thing sealed as tightly as it needed to be in order to be able to be a hermetically sealed biosphere. Uh, and uh, so I will remember the first time I saw Tabor at the biosphere where they were um, trying to, uh, they were working with, with one of the very early seeming uh, approaches, which was butyl rubber, something like that. It was like this really black gooey substance that they were pushing into all the seams. Now remember that glass and steel obviously have different uh, thermal expansion and contractions. Uh, and so as the biosphere heats and cools during the day, the whole structure moves by several inches in the summer. And uh, so they were having to deal with that movement, which is why they started out with all of this black gooey stuff uh, that was all over everybody trying to install it. Clearly it didn't work. So they ended up with this really interesting uh, technique of having the, the panels of glass essentially floating in sandwiches of um, silicon. Uh, and I think there's an image coming up of, of sealing all of that uh, in a minute. So Biosphere 2 sort of had to be constructed, sort of an instant biosphere. So we, we collected plants from, uh, from Venezuela, from botanical gardens in, in England and in the US um, and uh, from around the world and planted and, and assembled the biosphere uh, along with then uh, all the big panels and then the glass that went on top of that. So it was like a huge tinker toy project. And that of course is putting uh, a tree into the rainforest. Uh, so um, on the left, uh, we're sealing those floating frames of glass. Um, there is 60 miles of glass edge seam in Biosphere 2. And all of those seams uh, are maintained and uh, tested with little vacuum chambers. Uh, it was a huge effort to seal up the biosphere. And then on the right is uh, putting the very first life into Biosphere 2, which was the soil that went into the farm. Uh, the uh, marsh there is uh, actually simulates about 150 miles of estuarine system from fresh water to salt water, and each of these divisions that you see on the left-hand side there is a different salinity and ecosystem that all then uh, works together with a, a water flow system 
So on, on the uh, right there, you're looking across the savanna, can't really see the ocean at the beach at the far end, and the rainforest is off in the distance. So the marsh was collected as, as cubic meters of extant living ecosystem of a marsh from an area in Florida that was actually being turned into a parking lot. Uh, and then Tabor and I just really had the harsh duty of collecting corals, which really meant that we went to the Bahamas and uh, Baja, not Baja, um, the Yucatan, uh, to collect corals. Uh, it was very odd uh, experience because when you collect corals, you're effectively down on a coral reef with a hammer and a chisel collecting whole heads of coral that we're then bringing up and putting into the ocean. We were collecting these corals though from areas that had already been badly damaged by uh, hurricanes. Uh, and uh, we also had to go and collect all the fish. So I was also in charge of collecting fish that went into the biosphere, which initially, which was uh, an interesting ordeal. Uh, so then after uh, several years, we started the project in conceptually in uh, sort of 82, 83. But Mr. Fuller essentially double dog dared uh, the team to build a biosphere uh, and then uh, began construction. Groundbreaking was uh, in 87 uh, and we went in in 91. And so this is a shot shortly after completion. And there we are uh, before we went in. And then here we are going in. Um, yeah, it was a big day. It was actually very funny being uh, you know, right up to the moment as we were walking in that airlock door that you can see us walking into there on the left, there were literally a hundred people running out the back airlock, out the back of the biosphere. So the moment that we walked in was the very first moment that the eight of us were inside biosphere two alone with no other people. And now you're starting to get to what that feels like. <laughs> So um, we, we thought we'd show you a little bit about the farm. Uh, you know, if you've been to Biosphere 2, you're very familiar with all the different ecosystems, but not the, the agricultural system, uh, which is not there anymore. It's got a great experiment inside that I won't go into now. Um, so here's just a few shots uh, inside the, the farm, or the intensive agriculture, as we called it. Uh, so we are collecting at the top left there peanuts. And one of the really sort of cool things when you think about holistically about a farm like this, when you're really trying to eat every calorie out of it, and also think that we had to not just get every calorie, but make sure we had enough fat and protein and, and you know, all the right amino acids and everything. And so uh, we took all of the food that, well, that we didn't call food. So in this case, it would be all the greens from the peanuts. So on the top right there, we're actually taking the peanuts off the, the peanut plant. And then on the bottom left, I'm feeding them to the goats, uh, which of course would give us uh, amazing milk. And, and the peanut leaves turn out to have very high protein for uh, goats. So the goats were amazing. We also had pigs and chickens. Uh, and then on the bottom right is our doctor, Roy Walford, uh, who is threshing wheat uh, as well. So as I found out, one of the big questions uh, we had going in was, you know, how, how does the chemistry of a biosphere work? Uh, so my job was to try to figure out and understand the chemical cycles going on, especially in the atmosphere. And you, you may have heard that we lost oxygen in a way that we didn't understand. Um, we, we originally thought that we would, uh, for the, every time we lost oxygen, we'd gain carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide would be the real problem, but we were losing oxygen without an appreciable gain in carbon dioxide. And I can go into the chemistry of that later if somebody wants, but in essence, it was a, an interaction we didn't appreciate before closure between the soil and the concrete structure inside. Uh, and so I am <clears throat> on the left there taking gas samples from the soil to be analyzed back in the lab. And on the right there in a laboratory that we designed to be inside Biosphere 2 uh, to do all the chemical analyses that we need to do on the air and water and soil and plant tissue and things in the Biosphere. 
so um, another area that actually you won't see uh, at the moment walking through the biosphere is sort of what we call the lowland savanna. We actually call it also our bio valve. So on the left hand side there, you'll see a three biospherians standing in the midst of the grass of that area in full growth. So it's pumping oxygen into the atmosphere, it's scrubbing CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, and then on the right there, we have stopped raining on it and there, thereby effectively turning off the bio valve. And now it's having almost no net effect on the atmosphere inside Biosphere 2. We didn't have uh, any animals to go along and harvest it all. So we were the, the herds of animals harvesting it. But actually, rather than uh, turning it into carbon back into the atmosphere, we, we banked all that carbon. Because we, our CO2 was uh, a bit too high in the biosphere, we actually took that, uh, all of those leaves there and stored them in the basement. So we were practicing carbon sequestration uh, inside Biosphere 2, uh, way back then. Uh, so this is, of course, one of our favorite topics in the biosphere, which was eating. Uh, <laughs> we didn't always have as much food as we wanted, and we all lost quite a bit of weight. Um, the, uh, the room on the left is where we let bananas ripen, uh, and that room was locked, um, lest we go in at night and steal the bananas. Uh, we also found it really important uh, socially and, and for us to have a feast sort of once a month. And so we had eight birthdays. That was pretty easy. We were pretty well distributed and a few holidays and we had to make up a couple. Uh, but this is one of those times where we all got together and, and had saved food over the course of that month uh, to make a big feast. And there's, uh, there's sweet potato pie and breads and uh, peanuts and rice and vegetables. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the pigs is there too. Um, so, so this gets us to talking about being in isolation, so, you know, which is a fairly topical uh, issue of today. Um, you know, we were somewhat prepared for being in isolation. We were somewhat trained for being in isolation and we were there for two years and 20 minutes. So let us hope that our current situation of us all <laughs> being thrust into isolation is a lot shorter than that. Um, and uh, so, so it, it turns out that there's a whole branch of psychology that NASA has studied called, called isolated confined environment psychology. And one of the things that happens in the Antarctic where they have plenty of food is food hoarding. And of course we had food hoarding and people food stealing, thus the uh, bananas were locked away. It was the only room in the entire biosphere that was locked actually. Uh, and seminal experiences. So one of the things that we also, one of the, the reasons that we had these monthly feasts was because they create seminal experiences, things that we can all come together as a, as a group to do that's completely different from everything else and sort of breaks up the, to a degree, monotony of, of being in isolation. Uh, this was similarly a party on the beach. Um, we uh, actually uh, brought a TV down once and put one of those little videos of a fire and we would catch ourselves warming our hands uh, on the video. Uh, but uh, again, these were sort of the events that were important to us to break up what, what was a pretty monotonous, hardworking day-to-day -day routine. So one of the things about being uh, in isolation um, is, uh, well, particularly for us inside Biosphere 2, when it was social distancing. You know, I think now we're calling it social distancing, but actually I think what many people are finding, it's more physical distancing than social distancing, as long as we're reaching out into our communities and staying connected in, in the way that we are today. Um, but regardless, uh, it can get monotonous and to, do it to a degree somewhat boring. And what can come out of that is uh, actually creativity, tremendous amount of creativity. Uh, and we planned for some of that. So Tabor and I took in musical instruments. That's us on the right. It really doesn't matter how good or bad our art was while we were in there. The point was we were doing it and it was great. 
Uh, we um, also loved to play with this idea that we were in Biosphere 2 and the rest of humanity was in Biosphere 1. Uh, and so we had inter-biospheric art festivals, um, us doing our amazing art on the inside and exchanging that with artists on the outside. Sometimes we jammed down the phone. Remember, there wasn't the internet where, uh, really in the way that we experience it today at all. Uh, when we were in there. So we were jamming down the phone. So there's a lot of tools now that we all get to use, like Zoom, uh, that we just didn't have then. And then on the left, table White, do you want to explain the one on the left? Go ahead. <laughs> so, so Roy Walford was the doctor inside who I mentioned earlier. Um, and he uh, was a spectacularly well-known uh, gerontologist. Uh, and has done huge amounts of work. You may be familiar with the high-low diet, the high calorie, the, the low calorie, high density diet, which as it turned out, we ended up being on, which is a whole other story. So his goal when he went into the biosphere was to go in as a scientist and come out as an artist. Uh, and so he was constantly coming up with all of these crazy things for us to do. And one of them, was this on the left hand side here, which you will not see, it was taken off the wall. It was done with um, you know, body paints. Uh, and those are full sized uh, imprints, people's backsides and their legs on the wall, uh, making the butt wheeled wagon that um, Tabor and I, the two characters in the front outlined in green. And uh, so the blue is the, are the wheels and then the red are the, the joined hands of the men and women that were the wagon that was you know, gonna go to the stars. So he had this whole story around this thing, which was, was really fun. Um, this is uh, several of us uh, taking a bit of time off and uh... Uh, you know, the, uh, the crew did split into a couple of uh, sort of factions that preferred to hang out with, e with each other, uh, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Certainly, uh, the psychological aspects were indeed some of the hardest parts of the Biosphere 2 experience, but uh, we're having a good time here. Uh, and then uh, after two years, uh, we came out. Uh, the, the answer to the question that we, one of the questions that we built Biosphere 2 to, to test was indeed it's possible to build an artificial biosphere and it works. Uh, of course, you know, we've, we've all heard about some of the technical issues that we had in the biosphere, uh, like we didn't quite have enough food and where did all the oxygen go? Well, it turns out that it's a very hard hypothesis to test. You have to, uh, you have to have built the biosphere well enough to know that you can build a biosphere that works. And what we found in Biosphere 2 was that uh, all the issues we had were part of the design of this biosphere, not intrinsic to the act of building a biosphere. So uh, you know, today we have Biosphere 2 as a research lab in no small measure because we found that we can make these small ecosystems in a closed system that's airtight and they thrive and work and predict and, and work in ways that, that one would understand. Um, one of the things that we then did is we wanted to actually prove to ourselves that you can in fact make small, tiny, in this case, tiny biospheres and have them persist for extended periods of time. You know, biosphere two is an N of one. Um, and it's really hard to prove anything definitively with that. And so we created hundreds, thousands of these little tiny, uh, on the top right there, is a small ecosystem uh, that we created and sent. Uh, this is actually being unpacked uh, uh, on orbit. Um, I think this is going into this is the space, mo space module on the International Space Station, um, where the animals inside there were the very first time that any animals had gone through multiple generations in space. And we had that ecosystem alive there for um, 18 months. Uh, on the International Space Station. Um, the picture below is us messing around with uh, developing those systems. I think we're pressure testing one, it looks like, before it goes, oh, that's actually the, one of the systems before it goes up. Um, and in fact, we've had one of these just anecdotally at home that we made ourselves closed for 20 years now, and there are still breeding populations of aquatic animals inside, which is pretty cool.
Um, Paragon uh, here is a company that uh, we started with some of the people after we came out of the biosphere, uh, and it does a variety of technology developments um, like life support systems. Uh, it has the life, parts of the life support system on Boeing's Starliner. Uh, it has a water recycling system going to space station this year uh, and uh, a variety of technologies used in spacecraft. And so it really is part of the legacy of Biosphere 2 uh, the, in the work that, that uh, Paragon does. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, we did was to uh, break the Red Bull Stratos jump. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen Felix Baumgartner stepping out of the capsule and spinning wildly as he falls down to earth. Uh, we uh, actually worked with, with uh, Google executive Alan Eustace to take him up to break the jump. You wouldn't necessarily have heard of it because he wanted it you know, very on the down low. Uh, being a Google executive and a family, having a family and all of that. So uh, we, we did just that two years after, uh, in 2014, two years after Felix's record was set, we set that record. Uh, and so on the top left, you can see that's the actual balloon that we took him in and you can see uh, just at the very tippy bottom of, the, of that hole, that's all balloon, by the way, that you're seeing there. Um, you're just only seeing the lift gas at the very top, it expands to fill the entire balloon, which would be almost the size of a football stadium once it's fully expanded at altitude. We took him up to 136,000 feet. The bottom left is him at altitude, having just been released from the balloon. So you can see the bottom sky right. is, what? Bottom right. Oh, I'm sorry, bottom right, other left. Um, uh, so you can see the sky is completely black uh, and above him that's that's uh, him in the spacesuit actually just as he was launching uh, calmly waving at us all on the ground and then the bottom left was actually during a, a, a test jump out of an airplane uh, and that is the only time you will ever see roller ba blades on the front of a spacesuit this is a full spacesuit that our team designed and the reason he had roller blades on the front was that the exit of the airplane was too short for him to stand up and get out of. So he literally had to lay on his front and be pushed out the plane. Thus, roller blades on his chest. Um, uh, we took a lot of that uh, work and started a company called Worldview that was originally going to do uh, sort of a space tourism, taking people to the edge of space. Uh, but in the process of doing the Stratex and other work, we found some really interesting layers of atmosphere that allow for navigation and station keeping. And so uh, Worldview concentrates on providing a platform for communications and remote sensing. Um, the uh, picture on the left is getting ready to launch uh, from our facility uh, just south of the airport in Tucson. And on the picture on the right was actually taken by a telescope at University of Arizona. Uh, this is that vehicle at um, about 75,000 feet uh, with uh, buoyancy control and uh, the uh, telescopes and the like at the very bottom. And last but not least, we're now working on Space Perspective that uh, we can't really talk a lot about yet, uh, but it is a, a human spaceflight company um, you know, very pertinent, I think, for Earth Day because uh, we really want to take a lot of people up to space so they can really experience our planet from that vantage point to really get that planetary perspective that we all need to, uh, to really address and appreciate our planetary challenges today. And one of the, the parts of the experience that we had in Biosphere 2 was to sort of get mm. what, what astronauts talk about so when, I, when you talk about that I talk with an astronaut about their experience in space they talk a lot about seeing the overview the world as a system and in biosphere 2 we essentially had a view of an understanding of the system that we were in sort of from the inside in our small biosphere uh, and so we think it's important for people to have that experience more generally and accessibly uh, to see really how small our world is uh, and so uh, that's what this is. Uh, this is for. So, Aaron, I, that's uh, that's that's it for um, for our kickoff here. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, some of those pictures, I'm sure uh, many of us haven't 
haven't ever seen before. So it, it's a real treat. And uh, speaking to what you were just talking about, uh, my personal question for you guys, um, when you're in a biosphere in a closed system and you feel the effects of losing oxygen and, and your breath is connected with your environment, how does an experience like that for as long as you guys did it, how does that change your perspective walking outside and just day to day? And do you still carry that kind of, and that kind of intimate connection uh, with our environment now? You know, it's clearly harder now. We certainly carry it now. Uh, you know, in the biosphere, it was so evident how tightly coupled it was. You know, we could make a mistake with the way we handled the agriculture or, you know, composting system or something like that, and you would see the results in the atmosphere that afternoon. Um, or, you know, once there was a, um, a, an eclipse and we could see for the time of the eclipse how the biosphere stops photosynthesizing. Um, we turned orange because of the sweet potatoes that we ate. And so we were exchanging carbon with the biosphere. Uh, and certainly, you know, we see, we, we carry that with us, but it is certainly harder in a day-to-day -day sense now because the earth is sort of so seemingly big. It's interesting, right? So we did have that incredible visceral experience that I think some of us are experiencing now, right? It's very clear how interconnected our planet is. And if, if people are plugged in, they're also seeing the incredible effect that humanity staying at home is having on the planet. You know, we're actually having the eclipse effect right now, right? We're seeing uh, all kinds of things, um, you know, pollution in, in water is cleaning up, you know, the skies are cleaning up, the, you know, the, lots of things that we're beginning to see because humanity is such a huge force on our planet today. So I do think we're having that moment now. Uh, and, you know, what's going to be interesting to see is how that carries forward. So when you, there's actually been some interesting work done looking at um, astronauts, and I'm sure some of you have heard of the overview effect um, that Frank White sort of developed this concept, uh, which really is, you know, in its simplest form, you, you go to space, you get this incredible experience of seeing the Earth in space, and, you, you know, you're suddenly smacked in the face with sort of how small our planet is, how interconnected we are. Uh, and, but what's interesting is that there is a measurable effect. There is a significant effect and that astronauts who, re who return from space uh, actually tend to get more involved in social and environmental causes afterwards. Sig and it's a st statistically significant increase. So what's going to be interesting is to see if there is any sort of lasting impact from all of this tragedy that we're experiencing on a global scale right now. That's going to be interesting. Uh, we have a question from Ronald and he asks, what would you want to see in, bi in a, biosphere, a Biosphere 3 project? And what is the future of synthetic biospheres uh, in space? Um, so kind of a modern take on, on Biosphere 2. Well, so it's sort of interesting, you know, all life as we know it is in the context of a biosphere, you know, a, a system of living organisms that are interconnected energetically and materially. Um, so, uh, you know, a Biosphere 3 would take all the lessons that we learned uh, in Biosphere 2 and in uh, ecosystem science and get closer to, call it the optimal design. Um, you know, we had imbalances in the way we stored and handled carbon and things like that in Biosphere 2. So I think there's a lot to learn there. There's also much more computing power now, and we can do a lot more with understanding how the system works on a modeling effort that, you know, we didn't have the computing power then, you know, this little thing called the 286 came out with a, <laughs> it was floppy drives just before we went in the biosphere. And that's what we were in biosphere two on. Um, and so uh, both the, the current computing power, AI and helping understand how the biosphere is working. Uh, and then in, uh, in space biospheres, and, and the company actually that built Biosphere 2 was originally called Space Biospheres Ventures. 
Um, and uh, we were building about the same time that the International Space Station was being built. Uh, it's sort of a fun way to think about uh, biospheres. You can take all the genetics of a biosphere in a very, very small container and build a biosphere somewhere from all those uh, seeds and uh, um, frozen embryos and the all, all kinds of uh, ways to transport the information that then builds a biosphere in space. So I, I think we'll find ultimately that that's how life expands through the solar system and beyond is in so the basic unit of a biosphere. And a, a question from Robert Christofferson. Uh, he asked, did each of you have a special place, uh, whether it be a hiding place or just a place to gather thoughts within the biosphere when you were uh, enclosed? Sure. Yes, I loved sitting on the beach at night, like at sunset was my favorite time or at night when it was starry out. Because when you sit on the beach and you can hear, you know, the sound of the wave machine, if you've been in there, it's this really strange sound. And then at sunset, you look out the windows and you look out through uh, the, um, the space frame and the space frame and the whole shape of the biosphere starts to feel a little bit like a Gerard O'Neill space castle. So if you look out the windows, you could for all the world suddenly be on Mars because the Catalinas turn red. And then at night, when you look out and you see the stars, you could be perhaps on your way to Mars. Uh, it, it was just a, a really wonderful way to have a sort of a flight of fancy uh, sitting on this human-made beach in Arizona <laughs> inside this incredible biosphere. We didn't describe the habitat much. Um, so the question brings that up too. We each had our own little apartments, um, sort of a, a sitting room and, and bedroom. Uh, there was one kitchen that Aaron is actually sitting in now, uh, the dining room. Uh, we had a medical facility to uh, uh, monitor everyone's health and to uh, take care of any issues that brought up an analytical laboratory, a machine shop, uh, sort of an office mission control space and gathering spaces. So the, the habitat area of the biosphere was actually pretty complex in and of itself. And uh, we have a question from France uh, and they're thanking you guys so much for being a part of this today. And uh, their question is, was there a wind generator inside Biosphere 2? And perhaps you could speak more of all of the technospheric support for these living systems that, that created the biomes uh, in that answer. Sure. Um, wind is actually very difficult to make because it takes so much energy to do it. Um, but we, uh, we had air handlers that uh, serviced the air by filtering out particles, uh, taking humidity out of the air to make water that would become rain. Uh, and if you took all of those air handlers together, they moved about um, sorry for the English units, uh, six and a half million cubic feet a minute of air, uh, which is roughly the volume of Biosphere 2 every minute went through one of these air handlers. And even with all of that six million cubic feet of air a minute moving through Biosphere 2, when you were in the Biosphere, for the most part, it was sort of just a wispy breeze. Uh, and one of the problems that a lot of the plants had in the biosphere was there wasn't the wind that would move the tree limbs back and forth and create stress wood. So they got these sort of tall, lanky trees that sort of wanted to fall over. Um, so uh, we wished we had a lot more wind, but it was very difficult to make that much wind. You don't really appreciate the energetics of wind until you have to actually make it. And then if I can uh, perhaps speak further to the energy production. Um, so the, the, the concept early on was that we were going to produce the energy for the biosphere from solar. Being in Arizona, that seemed like a bright idea, except at the time it would have taken acres and acres. Remember we were designing Biosphere 2 in the 80s and building it then. It would have taken acres of, uh, of panels and would have cost an arm and a leg or so, or three or four. Uh, and so we didn't do that. Um, and so there was, we used grid power and we, we actually had a backup energy system outside uh, in the event the energy went off. Um, you know, with sort of 
from the idea um, sort of philosophically uh, being that, you know, we're thinking of a biosphere being energetically open. And so we were getting the energy for our biosphere from outside. The, that's the technosphere question. We called it the technosphere. And somebody said biosphere two was like, uh, you know, eaten on top of an aircraft carrier. Uh, in the basements underneath pretty much the entire biosphere are a wide variety of technical systems, monitoring systems for the temperature and humidity and air composition mm -hmm. and uh, systems to heat and cool the air and water processing systems and uh, water recycling. So there's a, a lot of engineering that goes on to keep a biosphere running uh, when you don't have sort of the resources of the whole earth uh, helping balance the temperature, for example. Um, another question I have for you guys, uh, during the time of the experiments, a popular term was the concept of cybernetics, which is kind of getting this uh, technological feedback uh, in situ or in real time and letting that uh, allow the steering or the guidance of the biosphere as a whole. Um, how much of that was, was really going on during the biosphere in terms of driving, changing parameters of your, of your biomes for certain production? And on some level, were you guys the cybernetic systems just observationally in the changes that you would make as farmers and stewards of these landscapes? Yeah, so uh, both is true. Um, we did monitor uh, as far as was practical at that time. Um, you know, every aspect of the biosphere, the gases that were in the atmosphere, number of gases that were in the atmosphere, and the humidity, the temperature, things like that. Of course, we knew the levels of water in, in different tanks and ponds and the ocean and all of that. Um, so, so there was a certain amount of automation, but not a lot that was providing feedback just because all of that kind of thing was so early. I mean, remember when Tabor was designing the, I mean, this is crazy to think about. When Tabor was designing the analytical chemis, uh, chemical lab inside Biosphere 2, uh, his was the very first laboratory that didn't use paper printouts from machines. You literally had to write code so that he could not have paper because we couldn't have any paper in the biosphere. So we didn't have those kinds of capabilities of all of these sophisticated algorithms and things like that that we do today. So yeah, to a large degree, we were the cybernetic feedback. Uh, and we were the ones going, okay, we're not gonna water over here today because we don't want to have a spike of CO2, that kind of thing. Um. Yeah, pl playing into that, uh, we had a question uh, that kind of wanted to focus on the social, I social isolation. Um, and it's so relevant for people logging in now. And you two uh, spoke a little bit about how creativity was uh, uh, an outlet for you in isolation. But uh, what are some tips uh, for us as quarantiners here today? Uh, as we experience our own social isolation. Sure, so um, I'll start off with that one. So being inside Biosphere 2 was a little bit like sort of, I like to call it sort of a monastic experience for somebody who really didn't want to be in a monastery. Um, you know, and we thought we had really practiced that and understood it by spending a long time on ships and the you know, back of Australia. But it was, it was really different when we were sort of confined the way we were. and um, one way to sort of think about that that seemed to fit for the way my experience was, was that um, it was like I carried in a whole bunch of emotional baggage and sort of the routine day-to-day -day sort of lack of distraction, lack of movies to go to and things like that sort of brought those things to the surface. Things that I didn't really even realize I was sort of carrying around. And then that would create... Um, you know, flashbacks with these very vivid flashbacks, uh, which is, you know, I'm sort of back in a scene that um, happened when I was younger, but it just seems very vivid, more than just a memory. And people in Antarctica wintering over report that. Um, and, and sort of obsessive things like, I couldn't stop thinking about this high school sweetheart. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it was, uh, 
you were a soft or something and broke up in a way that wasn't very, you know, was, I guess, typical for a teenager. Um, <laughs> very mature, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and I couldn't stop thinking about her. And, and, I mean, and it was sort of like getting to the point where it was getting ridiculous. I mean, like, you know, this was 10 years ago or something. And, and, um, and so I finally tracked her down uh, and, and got on the phone and said, you know, hi, yes, it's me. Yeah, inside, you remember me from, and yes, Biosphere 2, you know, <laughs> this whole hilarious scene uh, ensued down the phone from Inside Biosphere 2. But I just had to say I was sorry. And then it all went away. But it was like this piece of baggage I had to let go of. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we had things where, you know, I would be, you know, mad at somebody for reasons that I didn't understand that was sort of connected with some piece of social, you know, emotional baggage. So I, I guess the advice is, you know, as these things happen, you sort of have to deal with them in real time. You can't really just try to sweep them under the rug because in my experience, it just could have got worse and worse. You know, I would obsess more and more or this thing would bother me more and more. And you know, we finally called up psychiatrists from inside the biosphere and, you know, and had to interview them and say, you know, are we going crazy? Uh, and, you know, you'd be on the phone with, you know, psychologists saying, yes, it's, it's me and Biosphere 2, I need help. Um, and, uh, you know, we weren't. These are were all pretty natural reactions to being isolated and confined in Biosphere 2. Uh, but uh, it helped a lot. So, you know, reaching out to people, reaching out to friends, you know, getting people to help you make objective assessments about what's going on. Um, those are all pretty important. So I think um, in sort of some of the takeaways from what Taylor was just talking about is that it is really hard being, being confined. There's no two ways about it. You know, I mean, we're really lucky uh, here because we get to go outside. We're right next to the beach. We get to walk up and down the beach. And so that we're really lucky. Um, but even then, we're confined here. And even now, it feels a little bit stifling, right? So I think the first thing that we all have to recognize is this is not normal. And it's okay for it to feel really not normal. Uh, and that in and of itself is kind of a relief. I mean, I remember when we really, that, that the time when I finally said, okay, that's it, I need, I need help, I need professional help, was when I, I was one of those flashbacks. I'm standing in the farm, I'm standing in the sweet potato field, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm back to when I'm eight and I'm having this terrible fight with my brother. And it wasn't just like, you know, daydreaming, it was like it was, like it was happening. And then I'm, I'm back and I'm like, oh, where did I just go? This is really strange. I think I just lost my mind. So, you know, I, I, we do find ourselves professional help. And this woman says, look, if you weren't having a strong reaction <laughs> to the situation you're in, I might actually think you had something wrong with you. So <laughs> but I do think it's really important to recognize that this isn't normal and we're going to have difficult reactions to it. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, and as Peter said, reaching out, you know, it seems, um, I wish I had bought ZoomStop um, because it seems that instinctively now we have the tools and we are instinctively reaching out to people. Like I found that I, you know, particularly in the first couple of weeks of isolation was reaching out to people I hadn't, you know, spoken to in a long time and, and vice versa. Uh, and it turns out that that is incredibly healthy. You know, we remember we are physically isolated, not socially isolated. Um, so all of those things are incredibly important. Um, yeah, first thing to remember, this yeah, I mean, is uh, not normal. Uh, uh, they did an analysis, as is topical also, going a bit more, um, uh, looking at what they call behavior settings. And so behavior setting is uh, like the office, you have people, that are different and a subject, a thing that you're doing that's different. Um, and uh, you know, the gym is a different behavior setting. Home is a different behavior setting. Uh, going out on vacation is a different behavior setting. Um, uh, bias for two was just one and most people have several. And uh, it was sort of characterized by the doctor we worked with afterwards as behavior setting deprivation. But we sort of had one and a half and that half was electronic communication with people outside. Uh, email, we, we did have this 
funny little thing was a bit like a, a fax machine on a screen that very slowly sent an image over. It took about four or five minutes to get one black and white image. Um, but yeah, having people to talk with outside, friends that I could joke with, uh, making that outreach uh, was really important. And uh, sort of uh, in the behavior setting side, sort of created stimulus and input that was new and different and very helpful. And we're closing in on maybe our last 10 minutes or so here. And we have a question from uh, Bill Stubler who asked, was there anything about the biosphere experience that was much easier than expected once you got inside? <laughs> that's, a great, that's a really good question. <laughs> Apparently not, because neither of us can think of anything. <laughs> no, the whole thing was... Well, I, I can't remember. Oh, you can think of something. So, uh, but it, it only became apparent when we came out. Um, and and we, we, when we came out, we, we called it social spaghetti. Inside the biosphere, it was, it was pretty straightforward, right? There was mission control. There was the people we knew outside we could call and each other. And we all sort of aligned along sort of fault lines of how we thought we should run biosphere too. And that was sort of the, the crux of, of a lot of the conflict in the biosphere. But it was all very, so you knew who the people were. It was all pretty straightforward. And, in where those fault lines were, it came outside. I mean, society is just phenomenally complex. And, and there's all the different people that talk to different people that say, I mean, you know, it was just sort of overwhelming. Um, and then uh, I, we also realized how useful habits are, uh, but we didn't really realize that till we came out. You know, there's the habit that puts the keys back in your pocket when you leave the car or the habit that puts the wallet back in your pocket when you leave the restaurant. Uh, all of these habits went away. And so we, we were just like uh, completely helpless at but points outside when we came out <laughs> because we didn't have all of these handy little habits that you know, sort of keep the processes of everyday life going. So um, in, in those aspects, uh, life was sort of simpler. And yet we didn't have trash as, as an example. We, 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 we spent two years without trash and we came out, we threw a party for a bunch of friends and we were astounded at the amount of trash that one party can generate. Um, <laughs> we, we were also astounded at the variety of food. I mean, it, it would take us three months to make a pizza. Um, we had to make the cheese, we had to make the dough, we had to grow the wheat, all of that. And you go to a grocery store and there's, you know, there's cheeses from across the world and there's you know, wines from Argentina and Portugal. And there's, I mean, this just goes on and on and on. And the, the, the amount of, of the, and, and variety of foods that we have available to us for the most part uh, in, in society is, is just astounding when you go from sort of the simplicity of growing it all yourself. It certainly reminded us how incredibly abundant this world is. For yeah. um, we've gotten a couple of last uh, significant questions about uh, toilet paper, and you mentioned that there was no paper available. Um, so how did that work uh, in the bathroom? Actually, I liked it a lot. We had um, sort of a little portable bidet. It was like a little thing with water that came out of it. Uh, so it was very, I rather liked it. Yeah, yeah, you just wash with water. Yeah, you just wash with water. It's, uh, it's really much easier. <laughs> and we've got a question from Joaquin Ruiz, who is uh, the VP of Global Affairs and the Executive Director of the Biosphere. Um, yeah. He asked, how would you create the perfect team to be in an enclosed system like Biosphere 2? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, so um, I think there's three different things to think about. So obviously selection is really important. Um, Russia got pretty good at selecting, um, uh, has gotten pretty good at selecting people to go to space. NASA has certainly gotten pretty good at selecting uh, selection criteria for who to do these kinds of things, particularly the long duration ones they're getting better at. Um, training is really important and uh, 
not just physical training, it's emotional and mental training. Uh, we were completely blindsided by how difficult those two years were going to be emotionally. Uh, and then the third thing is uh, giving them the right support. Uh, so the, um, interestingly, astronauts have discovered that uh, mission control can be quite a meddling entity uh, and uh, actually be not supportive or very supportive. Uh, and, and it can have an outsized impact on the team. Um, how mission control behaves towards the team. Uh, you're, you become hypersensitive in an environment when you're enclosed for a, a long period of time, it seems. Um, uh, and things get, do get, tend to get a little out of perspective. So that's incredibly important as your support structure while you're in uh, as well. So it's not only the selection, it has to be three things. It's the selection, it's the training, and it's the support. Because if those three things don't all work together, uh, it will become quite tricky. Yeah. As Jane said, the rest can become pretty good at that selection part, but I, I tend to think that part of, it, part of the training aspect that Jane talked about is actually putting people in isolation and see how they do. Because it's really hard to understand it unless you've done it. And you wouldn't want sort of the first time somebody's experienced long duration isolation to be, you know, on their way to Mars. Um, and so, uh, you know, we tend to get these very type A people, you know, oh, I can take care of anything, I can handle anything. And we were sort of that way going into the biosphere. And then with the crew after us, we said, no, you, you, you need to, you know, have, do these things, have this psychiatrist that you work with, you gave them all this advice. And the response to our advice was uniformly, you guys are just wimps, you know, we're, we're, we're the type A ones, we'll do great. And, you know, a few months later, they were calling us up with all the same problems we had. Um, so uh, part of it is just, you know, training has to include experience. You guys, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got to run off to our next webinar with a couple of modern coral reef uh, biologists. But I think uh, I would join others in saying that uh, it's just such a pleasure to be able to talk to you guys on Earth Day and just hear firsthand about your experiences in the biosphere and how they're so relevant to uh, what we're experiencing now. Um, so thank you so much. And I would encourage all of our attendees to uh, look up Jane and Tabor on social media and look into worldview and the space perspective as well. Uh, and we'll see you on the next webinar here starting very shortly. So thanks again, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Bye.